Welcome to Make Me Data Literate, the podcast that makes data intelligible from the Australian Data Science Education Institute. We're on a mission to make the whole world data literate. I'm your host, Dr. Linda McIver, and every week I'll interview someone with a wild and wonderful relationship to data. Let's see what we can find out. Hello, and thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Make Me Data Literate. I have a very interesting guest today. I'm very excited to introduce to you Cameron Murray. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me, Linda. It's awesome. So can you tell us who are you and what do you do? Uh, well, Cameron Murray is my name. I'm an economist. Uh, my, I have an official title. Uh, I'm a research fellow in the Henry Halloran Trust at the University of Sydney. Um, and what I do day to day is research on housing and economics. Um, and before that, I'd worked for property developers, I'd worked in government regulation, I've worked as an economics consultant. Uh, so you know, these days I just write academic papers and books and argue with other economists mostly. And uh, a lot of those arguments do center around um, what the data is, what it means, how we interpret it. So I've really appreciated listening to your previous episodes and I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Oh, that's awesome. I'm really interested in the idea that you've gone from working for property developers to um, researching housing. Was there a, an epiphany along the way? That's a good question. Uh, I I did a degree. I probably have a different path to a lot of economists. My first degree was in property economics, which was less economics and more property. So a lot to do with mm valuation, marketing, planning, uh, financial models, um, those types of things. And when I finished that course, I, I essentially won a prize at this, uh, from this developer who was looking for young people out of the university to come and work for them. And so that's what I did. I got this, this job and, and met other people and I ended up working for a different developer as a sort of junior uh, nobody, but learning the ropes of the business. And I, I, maybe I did have a little bit of an epiphany and I guess what sticks in my mind today, you know, 17 years later, is that the development industry at the time was not really interested in building the future, building a legacy, innovating and breaking new ground and doing better designs. At the end of the day, the industry was a spreadsheet that just wanted the biggest number at the bottom and it didn't really matter what you built. <laughs> um, and That's I think it's changed. Brilliant. Well, I think it's changed a little bit now. Back then there weren't so many brands in development. So um, it was just the start of the publicly listed developer who actually had their name on their projects. And then if you wanted to go to their next project, you could just go and find out who it was and look at their old projects. So at the time, it was a project by project. You start a company. If things go bad, that company gets dissolved. You move on and you rise up as someone new for the next project. And Yikes. I don't think that's a good long... It doesn't have good long-term incentives, whereas the handful of very large companies that do housing development now... I think I have much better incentives and reputations to protect um, for the long term, which is which is nice to see, but um, has taken a while to get there. That's interesting. My, we've got in our area a lot of places, there's a lot of teardown uh, rebuilds happening, including one right next to us and one behind us and probably another one behind us shortly. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And my husband commented the other day that uh, houses have... Uh, like a a planned lifespan, like there's actually planned mm -hmm. obsolescence in housing. And we extended mm -hmm. our place, gosh, nearly 20 years ago now. And he said, probably if we tried to do that now, people would tell us it's too old. And yet hundreds of years ago, the houses, you know, were built, well, some of the houses, the, the rich people's houses at least, were built to yeah. to last almost forever. I think that's still true now. I think if you do a very fancy, architecturally designed premium house, it's going to last a lot longer through your choice of materials and and whatnot. So I don't think it's it's too different. But that's yeah, that's a common pattern we see everywhere. The 
the automation mass production effect is is the you get efficiencies from building new things right the mm. you know, retrofitting and things because it's so labor intensive you just don't get those efficiencies and i, I have lots of mates uh, who are builders who do knock down rebuilds and 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 my good mate i asked when i wanted to renovate our place he said you know you know if you knocked it down it would be a lot cheaper but unfortunately <laughs> our house um is you know heritage or, or or conservation protected in our neighborhood so we just started it up and and kept it going and didn't do anything major it's it's um from a, a sustainability and environmental perspective it, it's a little bit devastating to see you know the the house next to us was perfectly good but you know not new and shiny and it feels like it feels like the the churn of mobile phones you know where you have to have a new one every two years mm. it feels like you know we have to have new and shiny Maybe uh, look i i bias. definitely get that feeling um look i used to go dumpster diving and all sorts i hate seeing things wasted um but i think the more i've looked into it the more i almost see that our ability to do this is essentially because we've become so wealthy and effective at producing goods and services so it's almost a sign of how well we're doing that we can um you know we don't have to be like india and have 15 people squeeze in one taxi to get from a to b uh, and be very efficient um, the the beauty of economic progress is that we can be very inefficient and have lots of options and a lot of redundancy in the system um, so you know i think my views changed on that a little i still don't like seeing things wasted but i think i've accepted it as part of of part of the modern world that's an interesting perspective i like a, a way to see the positive what did you have to learn to do the work that you're doing now you said you have a, a degree in property economics and i know you have a phd um after that was this was there something missing from your formal education <laughs> uh well, what did i have to let me go through a, yeah there's a few things um before i get to what was missing let me just maybe say what i had to learn and i think as an economist the, i almost describe it as a language what you have to learn is the lingo and what people mean when they say marginal cost or what they mean when they say equilibrium. So it's really, it's like learning a language and, um, and understanding the meaning of words and being comfortable then using that language with others and understanding what they mean. So that's what you kind of, I've found you have, have to learn is it's like learning a language. Like, so, so I think, yeah, most university degrees are pretty good at that. Um, they're good enough that you can converse and feel comfortable. But maybe what's missing and I'll get to later is I'm not really sure they um, help with the like a more deeper or logically coherent way of understanding those terms. You could get comfortable listening to them, but you won't be well trained to understand when there's being, those terms are being used in a contradictory way. So there's a lot of yes. deeper level of understanding. So you'll go, you'll be comfortable in a conversation. Oh, well, the equilibrium outcomes this and therefore this. And but there's a there's a an economic rent here and this. And you you know it, it sounds good. And you're like, oh yeah, I remember that word. Oh, that, I can see roughly. But then if you have that next level of understanding, you can go, oh, but if it's this equilibrium, there's no economic rents because that's the assumption of the equilibrium. You know, so or whatever the case may be. I'm just throwing out jargon at you just to give you a, an indication yeah, of what it would sound like but you can understand what my, my point is that there's a there's a deeper level of understanding that i think um, you start learning it when you start teaching because everyone keeps asking you well is that consistent with this what about this i did this and um <laughs> so that's the 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 thing that's kind of missing or uh, one of the things um another thing you kind of have to learn is uh about the sort of social structure of the discipline as an economist, you have to understand um, 
how academics fit in, how the public sector economists fit in, what the think tanks do, uh, who, who, how the debate is controlled. Um, if you're in academia, you have to understand the social structures of getting in the academic journals and making sure you don't um, say that the, um, you know, the, the, the um, sort of main man or the, the he- what do you call those people, the messiah of a particular discipline or topic in your field, you just make sure you don't insult them in your journal articles or you'll never get published because they're probably <laughs> uh, one of the editors. So there's this whole social fabric of the discipline. Um, there's the language you have to learn and there's a the social fabric that you have to learn. And um, you don't get a lot of that during your degree, but as a PhD student, I think in economics, you pick up that social uh, structure a little bit more uh, just informally as you go and start participating in in your area so that's sort that's, of what you have to learn yeah it's the politics of the discipline isn't it yeah that's right and and I got involved with the the Economic Society of Australia which is the the national sort of body uh, quite early before I started my PhD I was in the young economist group and when I was a public sector economist and so yeah, I, I think I learned pretty early on who's who in the zoo and yeah. how that fits together. But, um, yeah, it, it's kind of interesting because the technical parts of it are very straightforward. So I think the more interesting parts are the the lingo and the social elements. That's really cool. You mentioned that you do you work a lot with data. Did you learn the, the tools that you needed um, to work with data as your formal education or did you have to kind of learn that on the fly uh so i learned i self-learned all of that yeah um i actually found the statistical courses at university um they're fine theoretically to learn if something's an unbiased estimator or whatever you happen to care about but one of the um, issues is the practicality of the data like I almost feel like sometimes the statistic the statistic the statistical methods are more advanced than what the data allows you to do because <laughs> yep. they're all, you, you're trying to overcome all these assumptions you have to make about the data to essentially do averaging in a really fancy way and <laughs> um, like that. that's what I just <laughs> everyone go oh, I did a regression model I'm like you averaged it really well um, <laughs> Because one of the results you would know is that you know the the, the linear regression model uh, works out to be uh, have the same characteristics as the average of um, the various inputs. So, um, what was what was my point there? Yeah. So you learn this the the algebra and the the maths of it, and you get it. But at the end of the day, you're working with tools. It's like it's like trying to become a painter and learning about um, art by looking at the gallery and studying and writing essays about what paintings look like, but never picking up the paintbrush mm. and giving it a go. And, and so that I had to self learn and thank you all my friends on stack exchange, which is the <laughs> online website where all the, all the nerds hang out and help each other with their coding problems. Um, so, so that's been all self learn. Um, and that's what's missing from, formal education in economics. Now you can do, I did do particular courses on particular things. I did this network analysis course in a particular um, programming software um, tool. Um, But at the end of the day, that that one was almost outdated by the time I learned it at the university and and the rest of the world had moved on, which is common. But luckily I'm interested in this. So even now, I I was on Stack Exchange this morning learning some stuff. Um, so I, I kind of like learning um, to use the latest gear. Um, so that's just something missing from the, the formal education and something you've got to do yourself. I was still waiting for someone to say, oh, yeah, I learned all my data skills at university. <laughs> I, have, I haven't, haven't heard that at all. Um, but I think it's interesting the theme keeps coming up that, ah, you know, I learned these statistical techniques, but they assume that the data is perfect and the, that you get a perfect curve or, you know, there's I, and nothing complex about it. 
Yeah, you're totally right. Well, I think after a while you realize that you start doing the painting yourself and you realize that, hang on a minute, that's not, that, that color's not that, it's just a trick. Um, so when, once you realize what playing with data is really like and that you can get lots of different answers and that when you're honest with yourself, it shows you one thing, but you know, you know, you can't be certain about where to put it. There's no method that tells me what that uncertainty is because I, I've taken this from a survey, you know, there was, there was A, who did I survey and the whole, all the assumptions there and all the intermediate steps about what I kept, did they even understand what I mean? And now I think my technique is going to tell me these are the confidence intervals or that my answer is definitely there. I think you learn, when you learn by doing, you really learn to take that a little bit, each result a little bit less seriously, but look for these common patterns that just always come up and go, okay, I think there's something there because no matter who slices it or how they do it, when they start looking at these types of things, this is a, seems to be real. And that's my general approach now is um, people, people will say, oh, look, this paper did this and it found this. Oh, it's, it's changed a whole, um, a whole discipline. We have to rethink all this. And I just think, well, okay, that's you know, 50 people found the opposite and they all did it in a haphazard way. Someone's going to find this result randomly. And yeah, I think there's a bit of an art to that. And it's interesting because when I did my property economics undergraduate course, we did a lot of valuation, marketing, um, feasibility studies on buying sites. And we always had the discussion, is this art or science? Because at the end of the day, um, you're going to be re rewarded in the industry by, by making money, but I can't tell you exactly the recipe here. So there is some kind of hidden, unwritten, unspoken thing that we're trying to capture. So there's this art element to it. And perhaps perhaps some people admit that more than others, but I, I think it's important to note that there is an art to it. Um, oh, finding out what the... Hmm. I, I, I like the idea that you... Um, that the more you know about it, the less certain you are of your results. I think that's, you know, that's that's something I'm working really hard to build into the way we teach because... We have this tendency to go, I have a result, ta-da, it must be the result, the one true meaning of everything, and then you move on to the next thing. It's like, well, did you test it? Did you what what else could it mean? You know, those yeah. kind of questions. Oh, well, you're totally right. This is the other thing. Just because there's a pattern in the data, and I like to use the word pattern because that's that's all we're looking at, really, at the end of the day. The it doesn't mean that you, the thing that you thought of to explain it is the right one unless, because, you know, you can think of any of thousands and thousands of ways to get this pattern in the data and you can eliminate some from being totally ridiculous, but I'm sure um, you can find someone else to come up with a reason why this might be there that you haven't thought of. Um, and I think that's where the interesting science happens i guess at the end of the day is is not well there's the you, you need the you need something about the physical world or the the world to to be grounded in but at the end of the day it's the conversations about uh, expanding our ability to uh, think of new concepts or ideas that help explain what's going on in the data that's where i find it most interesting and so you might see a trend in my work in the last five years my, my, essentially my data analysis, data analysis and sort of statistical approaches are getting simpler and simpler and simpler <laughs> to the point, to the point where I, the last paper I put out was just literally, um, had monthly average prices and monthly average quantities on a chart. And I just said, this is it. This is what the data looks like. Um, I don't want to do much more because we already can see patterns here. Why don't we have a conversation first about um, what what world could generate this this pattern before we go further? So that's what I my sort of current thinking is. I like that. A lot of people, when they start to teach data science, think they have to go straight to teaching 
k-means clustering and machine learning and you know actually going and doing the fancy stuff i'm like can we get the basics first i don't mind if you go do that but but we're not there yet (laughs) we need to understand the fundamentals and ask more questions i'm totally with you and just remember all the scientific progress we may made until the last 30 years was made before all these methods and all this <laughs> computing power by hand, literally drawing up tables, doing averages, plotting things, um, being smart about understanding parts of the world that created the data, so the data generating process we like to call it, just being smart about understanding that or manipulating that and seeing what you get, like doing experiments, that got us from the dawn of time until the the advent of computing and and all these new techniques so i i think it's you know there are plenty of new topics we can still take those basic approaches to and and learn something as well so i'm totally in agreement there that's a really good point is there something that you think if everyone knew this about data it would it would change everything it would just it would make my life easier it would make things better or you know so it's one one <laughs> one fact or uh, idea to rule them all. Oh, look, I, I think it's probably everyone would say it, but um, there is no theory-free data in a way. You have to have something in mind to measure something about the world first. So let's just say I was a biologist and I know it was in the Amazon jungle and I was counting monkeys. I have to know what's a monkey and what's not a monkey before I count the monkeys. Yep. I'm going to count I'm going to count these plants. Well, is that a fungus or a plant? Is it in or it out? Is it out? You can't even count the things you observe until you have a theory about what's included in the thing you're counting. And so, you know, all data has a theory in it and you need to appreciate that and understand that. I think it's a little bit probably deep and abstract but in economics it's much much more obvious Um, for example we think gdp is something about the world you know the gross domestic product well is it maybe but we just invented it in the 1930s what what happened before then was was there a gdp or because we didn't measure it did it not exist and once you start down this rabbit hole and this is what I did after my degree is, well, I didn't really learn about how the economic data was collected. And I went on a real, um, I don't know what to call it really, a nerd indulgence of <laughs> reading all the concepts, methods, uh, documents from the Bureau of Statistics about, about the consumer price index and inflation, the gross domestic product. Um, all this data we think is, real i'm like well that's a survey of this every month one eighth of the survey gets rotated out and there's this error so we just smooth it all off at the end anyway because we think there's all this other variation and on gdp it's interesting because the guy who invented gdp his name is oh he's started the national bureau of economic research um in the united states during the great depression and his name was Kuznets, Simon Kuznets. And when he invented it, he said, oh, we should add up the industrial production, but we would definitely subtract the military and any luxury housing and other wasteful things, right? Oh, we wow. should definitely, yeah. Uh, I wish I had the quote on hand from his um, original paper proposing the method where he's like, you know, we shouldn't count all this luxury nonsense uh, that the, le- the elites uh, consume. That's not real. That's just, it's not. <laughs> important <laughs> and That's amazing. Uh, yeah yeah and then gdp has just evolved we just simply kept making it up and we changed the rules we change what's in it constantly and uh conceptually so he originally thought that but of course once the war um broke out no one wanted to subtract military spending <laughs> but if we realized we added it in that number would look really good and so we just turned from subtract well we just started adding it in instead of ignoring it. Um, and then there was, interestingly enough, in 20, um, I'm testing my memory here, I think it was 2011, there was a, a, an agreement of the global statistical agencies to 
change the de- de- defini- definition of GDP. Um, so um, military weapons used to only be counted as uh, as uh, once, essentially. Production of them was counted once. And they said, well, actually, a weapon is kind of like a house. You produce it, and then it adds to GDP. And when you use it, you consume it, just like renting a house. And that adds to GDP as well. So we're going to reclassify it as uh, as an investment good and count it twice, once when we make it and once when we blow it up. Oh, man. And so because what that's what we do for housing. We count the building of new housing in GDP and then we count the renting of the previously built housing in GDP because we have, someone has historically just chosen that, well, houses are investments. Um, and so we get to count them twice, once when we build them and once when we use them. <laughs> and so... If we just reclassify over time more different things as investments instead of consumption items, we just get to count count them, count their intermediate steps of production uh, twice. So, you know, these are types of things you start digging into and it makes you trust a lot of things a lot less and makes you, I think, a better user of data because you don't take the level very seriously. I'm comparing it from today until 1950 to 2000. Well, you know, we've actually changed what we've measured. but And you focus on the things that it might tell you about the world, which is, is it trending up or has it started trending down? And does that change something? Is there a real pattern that we're seeing in the last few years that needs explaining? So I've become much more circumspect about... Um, reading too much into the data and just taking the little bits of information that I know tell me something about the world, uh, especially in the economic data. That's super interesting. And what fascinates me about that question is everybody says something different. Um, The closest uh, similar answer, I think, was probably Owen Churches, who's a statistician from South Australia, and he made the point that even the, the very simple how many kids are in this class question is actually you know has a whole lot of aspects to it like it are we counting the kids in the room today are we counting jane who left at the end of term two are we counting you know <laughs> fred is starting next term are we counting him as in the class what about claude who's away today like it, it and it really blows your mind once you start realizing that even counting things relies on that definition oh a hundred percent um and and the thing is with economic data so we have this system of national accounts it's the way we count the economy or add it up um my my old phd supervisor paul friders would always say nobody knows how to do the national accounts the (laughs) the the, like it is just so many assumptions across so different many different parts of it with so many different surveys and different data inputs he's like nobody actually knows you might know a little bit about some part and then it mixes with something else and then um the, the sausage of this number um no one can actually make it uh, by themselves. It's this evolved wow. beast um, because it's like, you know, thousands of pages of how-tos and and it's quite interesting, you know. People don't realise that different countries count their economy differently. So, for example, we've had a lot of talk about inflation lately, right? And we're saying, oh, the US inflation is really high, but in Australia it's only 6%, but in the US it's 9%. Or, and in Europe it's whatever it is. And I said, yeah, but you know, the major thing about inflation in the U.S. is rents and secondhand vehicles. So rents make up twenty um, percent of the basket in the U.S., uh, or they actually make up thirty percent. Twenty percent for owner occupied and ten percent for renters, and then used cars are like eight percent of the basket. So clearly, when those prices go up and they're eight percent or twenty percent of the weighted average, it, it has a big effect. Hmm. The thing is. The Australian Consumer Price Index, the measure of inflation, doesn't have used cars in it at all. Oh, wow. It's, it's got 8% of the basket in the US because we say, well, once the car's produced, uh, the household sector, when they sell a used car, well, that's just kind of like income for the seller and a cost to the buyer. And so it's just a swap, basically. It's not a newly produced good and service that we want to measure the price of. It's just like if I was collecting art and the price went up, well, that's not in CPI. Um, you've just swapped it. The buyer and seller have just swapped something lying around. So we don't even count it. And the US has 8% of GDP. And of course, the used car prices were booming recently because of the delays on on new cars. And then the same is true, just quickly, on housing rents. So the US 
says, how should we account for the cost of housing for homeowners? And they say, well, we we'll just pretend they're renting it from themselves and we'll take the rents from the rental market and we'll just apply it to what the equivalent would have to be for an owner-occupier. And so you, when you get this rise in rents in the private market, it has a much bigger effect in the US because they've got this what we call imputed owner-occupied rent in the consumer price index. Whereas Australia has a different approach and says, well, we're not going to we'll count rents for renters, but for owner-occupiers, we're not going to count the cost of buying a house um, because, again, an existing house is just swapping something that already exists. What we'll count is just the construction cost of a new dwelling. And so that comes into the basket at like 5% of the basket, the weighted average basket of the CPI. And then the rent for renters is about 8%. And so you've got this 5% construction, 8% rent. And in the US, it's 20 something percent um, owner occupied rent, 10% rental market rent, plus 8% used cars. No wonder their CPI is <laughs> going up more than us because they're measuring more of all the things that are going up in price. I, I'm so just... it's amazing. My mind is blown at the idea that you can't compare inflation in Australia to inflation in the US. I suspect there's a very large portion of the of the general public who does not know that at all. I think there's a large portion of economists who don't know it and they don't care either. <laughs> um, this is the That's weird disturbing. thing. I, so I went through this period of reading all this stuff and I'm going, well, I'm going to count, create a counterfactual CPI um, using this method because in 1997, we just totally changed the method. We used to have the cost of repaying a mortgage at the average price as the measure of the cost of owner-occupied housing. And then we just changed that in 1997 and said, no, we're actually going to do construction cost of new dwellings. And just we just carried on as if nothing happened and we just ignored it. And so I, I've been through that process of going, wow, that seems pretty important. What if I did a counterfactual one using the previous method but the new indices for all the subcomponents and seeing what actually happens, is it more variable? Is it slightly higher? Is it biased one way or the other? Um, and to be honest, it's just a little bit more variable. Um, but in certain periods, obviously, that bias is at one way during certain periods and the other way during... Yeah. But actually, if you look over decades, it's it's quite okay. But um, that will be the same in the US as well when inflation stops and their used cars fall in price very quickly. Uh, and because they're spending on on oil is a bigger share as well of um, you know, yeah. gas, petrol, um, th- theirs will fall quicker as well. So, yeah, it's just one of those things that um, only data nerds seem to know about. And for some reason, not a lot of people care too much about even people who you think should be really interested in that stuff. I need a moment to process that. That's, <laughs> that's absolutely <laughs> blowing my mind. That's horrifying. <laughs> um, well, I guess the I thing is, if it was widely known, it wouldn't be, right? If yeah. every economics teacher knew that and told all their students that, every economist would go, oh, let me just quickly double check what how they're measuring that these days. But mm-hmm. it's just one of those things we gloss over in the rush to, I don't know, say something smart or seem intelligent, <laughs> um, to comment on the data make- in a certain way. Or make comparisons that are wholly unjustified, as it turns out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Wow. Uh, what are some of the worst data mistakes you've seen? Oh, look, uh, I think being an economist, it's a fruitful area. Um, <laughs> I, I did think about this before we started chatting, and I think I'm going to give it a name, and I'm going to call it the no denominator mistake which is essentially saying a number that seems big without putting it in proportion to uh, some sensible context. Um, so, you know, I, I remember back when uh, the coronavirus was just starting and and my mum called me and she's like, oh, did you hear, you know, this many people have died in China this month or whatever the case was. I said, mum, how many th- people do you think die in China every month? Like, have, has that number crossed your mind? Are you going to compare one to the other? Or is, I think the number was 600 or a few hundred. I'm like, is I don't even know if it's a big number or a small number, mm. right? Like, yeah. and then, you know, I started doing some searching and then I found the headlines in Queensland, five people per day dying from influenza 2017. I'm like, oh, maybe a hundred in a month in China is not very many if it's five a day in Queensland, right? So... Uh, I think in the press, 
that is one of the big um, mistakes is putting a number out um, without a denominator, without the context yeah. of is it, a, is it a big or small number. And what's worse in economics is a headline that has the word million in it is just the same as a headline with the word billion. <laughs> not, it's, it's not a thousand times smaller or less effective at, you know, making an argument. Um, and yep. it doesn't, you know, terrible thing. So-and-so wasted a million dollars down, you know, big headline. And then down the bottom, oh, there's a $3 billion cost to this thing. And mm-hmm. we're just going to sort of ignore it and pretend it was a good value. I'm like, it's 3,000 <laughs> times bigger. It's 3,000 <laughs> times bigger, by the way. Um so yeah, that's that's. I don't have a specific um, article for you, but that's the class of articles. It it is a classic uh, area, isn't it? It's like the the headlines that trumpet. Oh, you know, there's a a twenty times greater risk of death with this drug than this other. And then you're like, well, hang on, what is the risk to start with? Yeah. Like, is, 20, is it? Are we talking about twenty times point zero 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 zero? Like that's so many right. zeros, you can't even see the number. Are we got have we gone from point, you know, something infinitesimally small to something slightly larger than you know? But twenty times sounds much more terrifying. Oh, look, uh, um, that's actually a real good economic trick, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> so. As I said, I did. I will have done economics consulting, and you've essentially just revealed the dirty secrets of economics consulting of how to make small numbers seem big. Um, because, <laughs> okay. you know, um, a lot of the time, certain industries want to show how important they are, right? Or we're really economically important, whether you know, the left-handed screwdriver business, right? Um, we, so, so what you do is you find a denominator that's really small and go, yeah, it's 20 times bigger than this. or the cost will be five times more than this. Um, You can also take an annual number, you know, whatever thousand per year, and then you can capitalize it and say, well, it's actually, it's 20,000, but 20,000 forever is, you know, 400,000. That's a much bigger number than 20,000. You know, you can pick and choose. Do you want to, a cost this year or do you want a cost for the indefinite future or do you want it over yeah. the budget forecast which are a four-year yeah. cost so you get to pick and choose and uh that's another class of you know data misrepresentation i've noticed that's a favorite political trick to say we are giving 10 million dollars to this particular cause and it turns out that's over 20 years oh. <laughs> well that's not that's... nearly as impressive as i thought it was <laughs> You're spot on. That's totally spot on. That's exactly, and you can see the political incentives. But it'd be great, I think, if um, the press and the journalists were much more savvy about this. So that's why I kind of like what you're doing. I hope there's a few journalists who start listening. <laughs> well, I've had one journalist on already, and she's amazing. So hopefully, we can do some more of that. Um, that was Juliet O'Brien, who runs the COVID nineteen data dot com dot au, and she's brilliant. Really great does some amazing data work, data journalism. Um, You kind of covered this already, but the next Mm. question is about data being deliberately misused. Have you seen some really um, wicked uh, misinformation style data? And how do we, how do we tell? How do we spot things like that when we're confronted with them? I guess uh, I would answer in a way that data can't mislead, but people can use the data to mislead the data doesn't do anything by itself right Mm. if you have a complete understanding of what this number is and how it was generated it is what it is it's the stories that you impose on the data i think that are the misleading ones and um there's a couple of uh, examples in economics if you've got a really big number and you don't like that number you call it a cost so you take (laughs) the same number and you call it a cost $10 $10 billion, $10 billion cost, unaffordable. It's going to wreck the budget. If it's a big number that you like, you call it an investment. $10 billion investment, jobs and growth for everybody. <laughs> now, the data didn't lie, obviously, but it's the story we impose on it. And in economics, that's just one of those tricks, calling bad things costs and good things investments. Um, so... Um, I think that's probably the most classic 
uh, case in economics. What also you find sometimes is people will use the same word to mean lots of different things. Um, so I do a lot of work in housing at the moment. And a lot of people like to say, well, it's housing supply. It's That's the problem, right? We need to supply more housing. I'm like, what is supply? What's supply? Is it the stock of existing dwellings? Is it how quickly the rate we're constructing dwellings? Is it the number for sale? Is it the number advertised? Is it the number of trades? Is it the willingness to pay for this? Is it the number of rentals? Is it the change in the number of rentals? What is it? And you'll find the same journalists, the same commentators, um, just called 10 different things. Housing supply. Oh, look, advertised uh, rentals in this inner city are down. Housing supply. Oh, look, construction's going down. Housing supply. Oh, look, uh, turnover's this. Housing supply. I'm like, these are all different things. And using the same word, <laughs> I think maybe you need to reconsider how you're presenting the data. So that's, they're my examples. Oh, I like that. I I have a horrible feeling after this podcast. I'm gonna I'm I'm not gonna be able to unsee these things. <laughs> Every time somebody mentions these kinds of things in the media, I'll be like, wait. Yeah, that's great. We should all be uh, because <laughs> there's a there's a cottage industry right of now of selling real estate data and housing data and getting publicity mm. about it. And mm. um, you know, at the end of the day, you make money selling your data and selling your services. So yeah. you, you're not there to inform accurately you're there to create headlines mm, um, so, so i'm very good at i'm well trained at ignoring a lot of it now <laughs> that's that's just how we need to train everybody isn't it that's the that's the trick for sure what's the first question you ask when you see a graph in the media ah <laughs> uh, that's a that's a really good question because to be honest i spend most of my day looking at graphs made by other people and making my own um, mm -hmm. it's the stock and trade of being an economist um, i think the first thing i think is what story am i supposed to believe when i see this what am i what what are they trying to make me think um and then i immediately once you understand oh they want me to think that this is really big or it's going down really quick or this is abnormally this pattern is abnormal um, and then i immediately think well what other stories also fit that data and then to do that you have to start asking questions why did they use this data for this idea why did they choose this starting date why did they compare these countries with each other and not others um, and then to be honest if it's something important where you know I have an interest or I'm doing research, I actually go and find the data myself and go, well, did it start at this date? Because this is the start of the survey and that's all we've got. Um, do people in this industry trust this data or do they prefer to use something else? Or are there, oftentimes you find there are multiple ways of trying to measure things and at different points in time, they diverge from each other. So you, I'll go and look at that. So, for example, uh, I'm doing a little project right now looking at housing rents because there are lots of headlines about housing rents. But as, as we said before, to create that number, you need some assumptions. What is it? So some are advertised housing rents. Some are advertised for more than three weeks on an online website during this month period. Um, some are actual rents agreed upon in contracts for bonds lodged at the New South Wales, you know, bond lodgement office. Some are the rents paid based on surveys of households that the ABS does of current rents, not the contract rents at the beginning of the contract. So there's all these different ways of measuring it. And so um, this is one of the cases where I think I've seen enough of those graphs online and I said, I'm going to go and get all that data and put it next to each other and see what the real story is because I know you're trying to make me believe one thing or the other, um, but this is my area, so I'm going to try and get to the bottom of it. That's really cool. What is it that excites you about data? Um, I think, you know, although we've been critical of ways to use data, at the end of the day, you can persuade people with data that um, 
there's a better way to view the world, I guess, is probably the way to put it. You know, I don't want to prove certain people wrong or certain people right, but just saying, look, there's a way to see the world that's consistent with all this data. Let me show you. Um, and I, I think, you know, rather than shying away from the storytelling, the, 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 the use of data to, to reveal something about the world that's sort of hard to see or to communicate it, perhaps. Yeah, it, it, it can be quite powerful. And I think that's why um, you know, a lot of the major news outlets these days have the data journalists getting involved because they know, well, a map like this or a graph comparing two numbers, you know, very simple mm. stuff. Yeah. Um, it can at least show what's not true. So as I said, you know, there's one pattern in the data, many stories, but there's certainly stories that do get eliminated by that pattern that, that can't yeah. be true and also. So so maybe it's more like that. So, yeah, there's, there's definitely exciting stories to be told and things personally I learn all the time about data and you know, I'm a curious person. So that's that's what excites me, learning a, learning something new myself from seeing those patterns and doing that work and just being like, wow, okay, now I can see the world better. Things are making more sense um, because I've observed these patterns in the data. I love that. The storytelling is so important. It's when I um, first started teaching data science with year 10s, I actually had them do their graphs by hand so they could make them, make sure they remained valid. So they do, you know, a, a, a proper graph first and then annotate and, uh, make that more interesting and more creative so that they can tell the story um, in a valid way but also a really compelling way because graphs on their own can be um, for some people can be hard to hard to engage with so that building that storytelling aspect I think is really important uh, I agree it's funny I actually draw all my graphs by hand on paper I'm like well you know, I, I kind of know the data, cause, but I'm like, mm, is that even worth putting in? Does that tell me anything, uh, that squiggly line, or do I leave it out? So I kind of draw by hand, well, if I had these two lines side by side, these two things, maybe that is enough to show the main message of the data without being confusing. So it's funny, funny you mentioned that because it's something I still do. I still draw it in my little book and think, would is that the best way to present the data? Am I concealing the important information or am I, or am I revealing it? And, and again, because I, I can make those choices, it makes me aware of other people doing the same thing um, <laughs> to me. I think that's really interesting too because uh, you can spend a lot of time faffing about with the technicalities of getting the graph right and whatever graphing package you use. And, and that can actually distract you from what it is that you're trying to say with the data and so to do it by hand and and abstract away the the complexities of the of the software and go yeah actually focus in on that story is is really powerful that's right because then when you come to the software you know i just want this one label i just want this and that's all i put in i don't you know i know there's lots of features you can use on the on the software but i i already know that i don't want them and this is what i'm going to put in and, so yeah, that's that's my method. Graphs uh, can suffer from the PowerPoint effect of you know using a different transition for every bullet point um, <laughs> style of of graph <laughs> creation. You know, yeah. using every effect and every color and every um, you know. There's, there's an art to that. Making I think, them three D well, right? and all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, there is. Yeah, but yeah. it's it's a, it's a really it's a tricky balance to strike if you're not careful. Uh, I, I agree. There's a lot of temptation. And, and as I said, I'm getting more simple with my statistics. And you know what? I'm getting even simpler with my, my graphs and charts because uh, mm. I, I, I think um, if, if you communicate what the data is clearly, um, then, then you don't, really don't need too much visually to, to comprehend the main, the main pattern uh, that's there. Totally agree. That's awesome. Thank you so much. This has been a, a, a an amazing and slightly horrifying <laughs> episode to record. And I really, I'm going to have to go away and think about it really hard. I think there's, there's some um, really important insights in there. 
Yeah, well, it's been great to have a chat, Linda. I love what you're doing with the podcast. So I look forward to listening to more episodes. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Make Me Data Literate. You can support the work of the Australian Data Science Education Institute at givenow.com.au forward slash A-D-S-E-I. Tune in next time for more conversations with amazing data experts.